to SNBC News for Life. I'm Wendy Chaplin. Tonight, the latest news from around the U.S., around the world, and our SNBC Health Report. A church tonight in California is fighting, to, is fighting in court to stay open after being sued by county officials. Santa Clara County recently sued Calvary Chapel in San Jose. The county officials claim the church is in violation of coronavirus restrictions by meeting in person. According to the complaint filed October 27th, county officials claim the violations and fines started when the church began meeting in person again in May. The fines for the church meeting in person are now up to over $350,000. Attorneys for the church say Santa Clara has the lowest tier of infections, members are safe, and no cases have been reported since members returned to services. The pastor of Calvary Chapel, Pastor Mike McClure, says he reopened in-person in services after seeing members suffering from mental health issues due to the isolation. Several churches in California and across the U.S. are currently suing for the right to assemble after local government shutdowns. The recent national election has revealed some surprising allies for the Biden and Harris campaign. A recent article revealed those who practice witchcraft circulated spells to help the Democratic nominees be elected to office. The author of the book, Magic for the Resistance, Rituals and Spells for Change, Michael M. Hughes, circulated the spell on his website. Hughes said of the spell, quote, even if you've never considered doing a magical spell, your country needs you now more than ever. He then encouraged followers to perform the spell and pass it on to others before voting. The instructions included buying tarot cards, candles, and spells to bind the Trump administration and Republican officials. The author also encouraged people to post photos of deceased members of government while doing these spells, and these were people he referred to as people of power. Uh, some of the names he mentioned was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Congressman John Lewis and Elijah Cummings, which both all three passed this year. The group of witches did this ritual on Halloween, October 31st, and November, 3rd, and, and November 2nd. Um, now, we're, we're just going to read a brief portion of some of these declarations that um, the author put on the website. Um, so basically, he was telling the people that follow him to light a, light a candle, one of the candles that he instructed them to buy, and then he said, um, he instructed people to say these words here, hear me, O spirits of water, earth, fire, and air heavenly hosts and spirits of the ancestors. I call upon you in this hour of need and request your aid to save my country and its people from the grip of tyrants and evildoers. Um, also, during those uh, parts of those incantations and, and prayers, I guess is what they would call them, um, it, they mentioned some declarations over some of the candidates. So for one thing, they said uh, Joe Biden, they called for him to rise, called for Kamala Harris to rise. Then in turn, they turned around and called the GOP and Republican uh, candidates and said them by name, saying Donald J. Trump, your power is broken. Mike Pence, your power is broken. Uh, Lindsey Graham, and right on down the list. And of course, as you notice that they are, uh, the enemy is using the prayer kind of similar to a Christian prayer, basically to um, do the same thing and so to speak that they're using that kind of power, trying to use it in the same way, but you know, obviously imitating a Christian prayer. Um, continuing with that, before we go to commercial, we wanted to report on some information concerning the Trump administration's litigation concerning the ongoing election results. The election has, been not, has not been officially declared despite what secular media is reporting. Votes will not be certified officially by the electorate until December 14th. Despite the Biden campaign claiming the voter fraud accusations are false, there are several incidents being accorded across the nation in contested states. Here are just 10 incidents that I will go through as quickly as possible. The first one was courtesy of Fox News. A GOP chair in Michigan said that 6,000 votes were counted for the Democratic nominees that should have been given to the Republican Party. 47 other counties used the reported software that caused this error. A Republican representative mentioned again on Fox News that a couple in Texas reported that their dead relative was registered to vote and did, not, and did cast a ballot on Tuesday. A poll worker who, was who is a registered Democrat recorded online being distanced from the counting procedure and urged social media followers of both parties to share his video after questionable practices were witnessed by him. 3,000 former Nevada residents received ballots to vote in Clark County, despite not meeting the qualifications. 
ballot monitoring in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, was not encouraged by police after Republicans in that state won their case claiming ballot voter fraud. The sheriff also in that story said that he was not going to enforce that. A social worker in Texas is under arrest after several counts of election fraud. Over, they charged her with over 134 counts of election fraud, uh, voter fraud, after receiving and using 67 mail-in ballots. Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani tweeted evidence that 21,000 dead people voted in Pennsylvania with over 9,000 that had died at least five years ago. Video again from Pennsylvania of at least three workers committing voter fraud, voter fraud altering ballots. And a worker in Detroit is accused of voter fraud, denied the accu accusation, but quickly went into hiding once they were replaced and once the investigations were called for. And in Nevada, there are one confirmed report of a dead person being registered and voting in this recent election, as well as 300 other ballots that are now in question for the same reason. We have to take a commercial break. More news in our health report when we continue. The cost of a big dream and a small dream are the same. The cost. What's the cost? Everybody say those last two words. Your life. Your life. You want your vision to come to pass? You want your dream to come to pass? It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost your life. Your life. For the month of November, we are equipping you to bring forth those God-given visions and dreams that can only be achieved by you. Purchase a physical copy of the Vision Package for just $35 or the Digital Package for $25. Both include an exclusive lightweight I Am Victory hoodie and the nine-part Bringing Your Vision to Pass series by Pastor Robin Gould. No more excuses. It's time to bring your vision to pass. Shop vccwordshop.com or stop by the Word Shop today. A county in England has announced possible raids on homes during Christmas celebrations. West Midlands Police Commissioner says if large groups, including families, meet together this Christmas, it will be a violation of current rules. The commissioner says police have no choice but to intervene. The commissioner says that he does not want to ruin residents' Christmas celebrations, but rules must be enforced. The announcement was made shortly after UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced a new shutdown for Great Britain. S British citizens will be restricted in their movement, except for a small list of activities, which includes work, school, and exercise until December 2nd. In SNBC Health News, the health benefits of cinnamon. This spice, according to research, may help reduce blood pressure levels. The research was conducted as part of a study on diabetes. Researchers found that patients' blood pressure reduced and A1C levels reduced following the regimen that included adding cinnamon to their diet. In addition to these discoveries, cinnamon is anti-inflammatory and helps lower cholesterol. It can help with protecting gastro and neurological issues. Cinnamon supplements have also been used to lower glucose levels in pre-diabetic patients. Researchers believe you can acquire health benefits from cinnamon by adding or drinking one-fourth of a teaspoon to one teaspoon of cinnamon a day to your food or drinks. And that is our show for tonight. If you'd like to review or share any of the stories from our newscast, be sure to log on to www.bccenter.net. Click on the Resources tab for SNBC News for Life. You can also take these stories on the go by downloading the VCC Charlotte app and, again, looking for the SNBC News for Life tab. On behalf of everyone here at SNBC News for Life, I'm Wendy Chaplin. Good night, everyone.
themselves against me round about. Oh, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. For thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. You're my glory, you lift my head. For thou, O oh Lord, you are a shield for me. My glory, the 
Father, glory, glorify your name. Your name is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Your name is holy and your name is good before your saints. Your name is above every name. Your name is excellent and majestic in all the earth. Blessed be your, oh, your name, O oh Lord. Blessed be your name. Thank you for being our shield and the our glory and the lifter up of our heads. Thank you, Lord, for taking fear from us, comforting us and strengthening us through your word. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our pathway. It's life to us, health to all of our flesh. It's alive and active and energizing and effective and productive in us. Feed us from it tonight. Strengthen us. And may we glorify you in return. Thank you for the angels that have been sent to minister for us as heirs of salvation. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who has been sent to teach us. I humble myself and yield myself that the ministry of the Holy Spirit may function through me that we may receive exactly what you would have us to tonight. And for all that shall be accomplished, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, sir. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we're going to continue our study on the book of Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. We're on part, part four. Before we get started with that, we're going to kind of look at some highlights of the first three parts since uh, it's been, you know, a couple weeks since we did the um, lessons on the, on the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. Um, but I do want to mention that last week we talked about um, it should have been a life-changing experience and uh, I felt like the, you know the Lord wanted me to kind of interrupt my current programming for that particular lesson and uh, I can definitely see why <laughs> you know because uh, you know with all the, cha the challenges uh, taking place relative to the elections um, he was preparing us, not that it would, would have just been the elections, but I'm thinking that the timing of it, you know, uh, preparing us not to be moved, you know. It's amazing how many Christians were just so moved, you know, so quick to, uh, you know, to throw in the towel and, you know, talking about being depressed and all this kind of stuff. That's, that's weird. You know, that's, uh, uh, you know, if, if you go back to the lesson from last week, if you've had experiences with God, you know not to respond like that. Amen. You know, we, uh, we know that uh, it's not over, but you know, just on a hypothetical side, you know, if things didn't go the way we wanted, we're still good. Amen. I mean, God still knows how to take care of his own, Amen. you know. And so he shared with us in the lesson last week, uh, you know, reminding us of the things that he had already done for us and how those things should encourage us and prepare us to face things differently from people that don't know him. Amen. So uh, just continue to be encouraged along that line and um, continue to, to pray and trust God for his will to be done. Let's go ahead and look at some highlights from the first three lessons and then we'll pick up from there. The book of Acts is entitled The Acts of the Apostles. Another way of putting it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church because the Acts of the Apostles were the Acts of the Holy Spirit is what the Holy Spirit did. You will receive what? How many in here already received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Okay. So what does that mean? We have power. I have power. My power comes from the Holy Spirit. I have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. I have been immersed into the Holy Spirit and I have been filled with power. 
So he's saying when you get this power, it's going to be for a purpose. The power is for a purpose. The purpose is so that you can be witnesses to me. A witness will verify things. A witness will tell what they have seen and heard. A witness will produce evidence. And so Jesus says, you're going to make sure that people know that I am real. Peter preaches to them, then he uh, points out the Old Testament prophecies that came through David about Jesus, showing that Jesus fulfilled uh, the prophecy. And this here helps us, is an example to help us know that, uh, you know, we have to study the entire Bible, okay? Because this, that, think about it, the, what we call the New Testament was not available at this point. Repentance is necessary, you know, to come into the kingdom, not just, not just uh, you know, repeating a prayer. You know, there has to be a heart change. We ought to live as if he can come any moment and work as if he won't come for a long time. The fellowship was important. important. Listening to the teaching was important. And praying together, all of those things are important. There are benefits in the, in the corporate body that you will not get by yourself. See, it's not one or the other, it's both. It's just like, you don't, you, you, get into the, you get into the word at home, but you also come and hear the word taught in church. It's not one or the other, it's both. Now here's, here's the verse I was waiting to get to in 46. It says, continuing, how often? Ha ha! <laughs> we don't ask you to come to church every day. <laughs> Continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. You know, the only reason why people think, you know, asking them to come to church more than on Sunday morning is, 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 is too much is because of the culture, not the pattern set for the church. When God uses us to perform miracles, then we want to take advantage of the opportunity to let them know who is behind those miracles. We want to tell them uh, about Jesus. We want to tell them, preach to them the gospel. As Peter said here, it is his name through faith in his name. Has God really done something for you? Then you just can't keep it to yourself. You just can't keep it to yourself. You have to tell somebody else. We want to make sure that we are the book of Acts. You know, that, that the last chapter hasn't been written before it got to us, amen? I'm not offended by somebody saying that they don't believe what I believe. That's their right. We don't have to fight because of that. See? But I believe that there is no other name <laughs> under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. As we look at the foundation of the church, we must realize that if we're going to be the same church, because remember this is not the early church, this is the same church in its early stages. So we don't have a different church. So if we're going to be a part of the same church, then we got to believe the same thing. Yeah. They were speaking boldly about their faith to their persecutors. These were not scaredy cats. Matter of fact, the people said, took note of them that they had been with Jesus because they saw their boldness. So it lets us know that if we spend enough time with Jesus, we'll get bold. They say to these people, we, we, we did hear what you said, but we have a choice, obey you or God. Now, Jesus had taught these disciples, don't fear him who could kill the body, but can't do nothing else. But fear him rather who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And so they're living up to what Jesus has taught them. And they say, we have a choice to obey you or God. And we just choose to obey God. So the focus of the ministry gifts was established. They're saying we need the, we need the ministry of health here 
so that we can focus on prayer and we can focus on the study of the word. All right, so those uh, complete messages are available in the Word Shop if you miss them and like to get them, or you can, of course, watch it online as well. Um, in Acts chapter 7, we have the sermon of Stephen. We left off last time in Acts chapter 6 where he was called on the carpet, so to speak. And uh, so he's being questioned now about the accusations, which were false, uh, against him. And so he takes this opportunity to preach to his audience here. So let's begin at verse 1. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives, and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. Okay, we'll pause there. Here uh, we're looking at uh, Stephen talking about Abraham's role in the history of Israel. And um, so we see that he refers to Abraham here as the father of their faith. Um, in verse 2, it says, the God of glory appeared to our father, Abraham. So um, again, Abraham is identified as the father of the faith. <coughs> and then we see he sh shares here how that Abraham received prophetic insight into the future of the nation. God gave him insight into what was going to happen. He, he let him know ahead of time that they would be in bondage in Egypt for a period of time and then he would bring them out. Um, he talked about how Abraham established this, the covenant of circumcision. That was a sign of the covenant relationship with God, which the Jews still keep up to this day. Um, and uh, the, the circumcision is performed on the eighth day. And, and I believe that science has determined that that is actually the best day to have a circumcision done. Um, then we have the messianic line established because, you know, Abraham had Ishmael as well and Isaac had Esau as well as Jacob, but the messianic line would come through Isaac um, and Jacob. And so in verse 8, it says, And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. Again, Isaac was one of uh, two of Abraham's first children. Of course, Abraham had some more children after that, after Sarah died. His youth was renewed to the point where he got married again and had some more children. Amazing. But... <laughs> After he had told God he was old. <laughs> yeah. So, but Isaac was the cho chosen one uh, for the covenant to be established with. And then Jake, Isaac had two sons. He had, he had a set of twins, Esau and Jacob, and Jacob was the one cho chosen. As descendants were chosen. So that's why God is known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, because that's uh, his, the, the covenant people were chosen from those um, uh, three. So uh, the 12 patriarchs, that, that, that's referring to the 12 tribes of Israel, named after the 12 sons of Israel. So he goes on, uh, Stephen goes on to talk about 
uh, the time that Israel spent in Egypt. And we're going over this. Some of this you may know, some of it you may not know. If you already know, it's a good review, refreshing your memory of, of, of the history of, of the nation of Israel. And if you don't know, of course, this is an opportunity for you to begin to learn. Uh, so we're going to look at um, this particular portion of, of, of Stephen's sermon. But ahead of that, I want you to uh, know that he's going to talk about Joseph, who was one of the 12 uh, sons of Israel. And uh, he's going to talk about Joseph's family reunion because Joseph was promoted to prime minister. Well, we call it, it doesn't say prime minister, but the equivalent of a prime minister in Egypt. And uh, God used him to save his family uh, during a famine. And um, eventually that family was reunited in Egypt. They were separated because Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. He ended up in Egypt. They did not know what had happened to him. They had no clue what happened to him. When they came to Egypt to get food, um, uh, Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize Joseph. Uh, but eventually, Joseph brought them into Egypt, uh, as well as his father um, and, and mother, and they his uh, stepmother, and then they uh, stayed there in Egypt, and the, and the nation grew. That's how, um, you know, they became the great nation of Israel, because it started off with just uh, 70 people in this record here. It says 75. Um, I'm not quite sure who, who the other five people that were added to this number, or whether or not uh, Stephen just didn't get the number quite correct in his sermon. but. Um, so, uh, let's listen, let's listen to the reading of verses 9 to 16. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all his troubles, and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Okay. So um, just reviewing once again what's being covered in here. And by the way, if you're interested in reading more of the story, it's found in the book of Genesis. Um, so this is talking about the 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 stay in Egypt, the, uh, the nation of Israel staying in the land of Egypt um, from the time that Joseph uh, welcomed his family there until God took them out. And um, you, as we read there, we see how that he, Joseph was separated from his family, but then there was a family reunion, and then the nation began to grow. Now. The next thing uh, uh, we're going to look at uh, a review here from Stephen's sermon is the Exodus. Because after a period of time, the Pharaoh that had promoted Joseph died, and a new Pharaoh came up. And after a period of time, you, you had a leader there that did not have any kind of relationship with Joseph and no, no uh, compassion for his descendants uh, or, and his brother's descendants. Um, and when you hear his, when you hear Joseph and uh, Stephen referring to them as our fathers, he's talking about the tribes of Egypt that they all descended from. So there's a new Pharaoh, and then Moses is born, and he grows up in Egypt. He, the the um, daughter of Pharaoh rescued him from the river where his mother was hiding him so that he wouldn't be killed, and took him home. Uh, Moses' mother became his nurse, and he was raised in the palace of Egypt, educated in Egypt. And it does, the scripture doesn't tell us this, but, uh, you know, it appears as if Moses was headed for the throne in Egypt. He may have become a pharaoh one day. But um, 
uh, God had another plan and apparently he learned about his heritage. Uh, after all, his mother was his nurse. And so she probably secretly told him who he was and uh, he wanted to save his people when he saw them being mistreated because here he was living in luxury and his people were slaves and in bondage and he wanted to be the deliverer but he wanted to do it his way and that was not the plan of God. So uh, God had a plan and, and uh, the plan involved him getting out of there so he can straighten him out <laughs> and get him ready to be the deliverer. So uh, he went to Midian. Uh, he made a retreat from Egypt to Midian and then he eventually returned to Egypt in order to be used by God to set God's people free to get them out of Egypt. And the last time, when we, as we talked about, um, it should have been a life-changing experience, we talked about all the things that God did to get them out of Egypt. Uh, let's read now, starting at verse 17, and we are going to, let's see how far we're going to go here. We're going to go to verse 36. Go ahead. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the, the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. All right. And so the, the sermon continues. And up to this point, he has a, a good audience. They are listening to a review of their history and uh, paying close attention to what he's saying. Um, uh, then he talks to them about the challenges that took place in the wilderness because as the children of Israel went through the wilderness, as you know, they um, gave God some problems. And so let's read from verse 37. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Before we go any further here, um, uh, Stephen is letting them know that when Moses said this, he was speaking prophetically about Jesus. Go on. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Remphan. 
images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So here, um, you see, he, he uh, points out some specific things that, uh, that they did. As he says, as is written in the book of the prophets, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifice during 40 years in the wilderness? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Remphan. So uh, he's mentioning some of the idol gods that they worshiped uh, before they were finally uh, taken into captivity. Before we uh, go to the next segment, I want to go back to verse 35. I thought it was interesting that he pointed out that um, this Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Um, when we talked pre prior, some time ago, uh, about angels, we talked about how they can transform into different things. And so the bush the burning bush was actually an angel that appeared as fire in the bush. And uh, in, in, in the book of Psalms, it talks about how he makes his ministers flames of fire. And so here, uh, Stephen confirms that as he talked about how the angel who appeared to him in the bush, the burning bush, um, was the one that God sent to assist him with the deliverance. Okay, now we go on to him talking about the tabernacle and the temple. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house would you build for me, says the Lord, or, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Okay. So as he talks about the tabernacle here and the temple, he points out that... Uh, uh, the, the tabernacle was made according to a pattern that uh, Moses had seen. When, when God told them to construct the tabernacle, he showed it to Moses. And he gave him the specific instructions on how to construct it. And then later on, he did the same thing with the temple that Solomon built. <coughs> Who did God give the, the vision for the temple to? David, yes, he gave the vision to David. So David had specific instructions on how to build the temple uh, because he was building a house for God. And in each, t in each case, if it was going to be a house for God, then it should be a house that God designed. So, um, you know, so God designed uh, both the tabernacle and the temple, yet he made it clear that uh, you couldn't hold him in a house. And he, uh, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Of course, in, in the New Testament, we refer to our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit, and God dwells in us. Yet we can have a place, just like they did there, where God would appear uh, in, in his presence and, and bless them and minister to them. But because God is a spirit and, and, and you know, he doesn't really need a house, so to speak, uh, when he ceases to be worshipped in a house, he don't care nothing about it. You know, when he ceased to be worshipped, uh, you know, in Solomon's temple, he just let it go to the ground, you know. So um, we have to remember that whenever we dedicate something to the Lord, we must not cease to worship him there. Uh, okay, so... Then he begins to confirm, excuse me, to compare the, the ancient Israelites to the current people that he was talking to. And then this is where, you know, they get upset because he, he, he gets real rough with them right here uh, because um, they were attacking him and lying on him, intending to, to bring harm to him. And so he says, beginning at verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, 
You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Okay. When, so here he tells them that uh, they're just like their ancestors who killed the prophets, persecuted the, the, the prophets and killed those who foretold the coming of the Messiah. And this goes back to, uh, or this relates to, you know, what Pastor Gould was saying this morning relative to few there be that find it. You know, here, here are these people that had all of these encounters with God and yet many of them chose to reject it. So we have the power of choice. We're responsible, we are responsible to share the gospel and to teach the word of God, but we cannot guarantee everybody's going to receive. You know why we do it? Because some will. Jesus said some will fall on good ground. And so that's what we sow for. We keep going for the good ground. But why is it important? I, I remember uh, an encounter I had with the, with the Lord, a conversation I had with the Lord some, a long time ago, where he said, I told you that some will fall on stony ground, some will fall by the wayside, some will fall among thorns, but some will fall on good ground. And he said, don't let the wayside, stony, and thorny ground discourage you. Keep sowing for the good ground. And uh, that encouraged me and still encourages me. And I thank God that one day a man by the name of Tom Skinner from New York, who was a former gang leader, came to Nassau, Bahamas and preached in a gospel crusade. And that's where I heard the gospel for the first time. I don't know who else got saved in that meeting except for my two sisters. <laughs> but I did. And so I'm glad he came for me. You know, and so that's our attitude is when we go out and we preach and we share the gospel, there's going to be somebody like me, somebody like you whose life is going to be changed. And that's why we do it. All right. So let's look at how they responded now. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is a very interesting story. Stephen becomes the first martyr in the church based on the record. And uh, when the people begin to uh, gnash at him with their teeth and just begin to probably say some awful things at him, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God. And you know, Jesus who had been seated at the right hand of the Father, got up. Isn't that interesting? He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I just want to encourage you that regardless of what persecution you go through, if you are serving the Lord and if you are faithful to him, he's going to stand up for you. He's going to be there with you in the midst of it all and you'll be able to go through. I've heard, I believe I heard of some of the uh, uh, Christians, you know, a few hundred years ago who, who were burned at the stake singing as they went to heaven. So it is interesting to see how apparently Stephen became detached from what was happening to him because he said, Lord, receive my spirit. And then he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Now think about it. They're stoning him. They are stoning him. They're hitting him with rocks, okay, as they are killing him. Now, how many, how many normal people in a normal situation will be able to pray at that point? I mean, you'd be, ah, ooh, ah, you know. 
No, but he, he was calm. And uh, uh, so I don't even know if he felt the rocks, you know, because uh, something supernatural was taking place in order for him to do all of that in the middle of what they were doing him as he uh, was being martyred here. And so we see this, uh, this is uh, this portion of the chapter here talks about the death of Stephen, and, and it also introduces Paul, who was known as, as Saul at that time. In, uh, in verse 58, the second part there says, and witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That is the same person who, who later became the apostle Paul. So he was uh, there um, supporting what was taking place because he was a part of the uh, persecution against the church. Okay, now let's go on to chapter 8 and see how far we can get here. Mass persecution begins. Stephen is the first ma martyr, but then there's a group of people that uh, included Saul, who later became Paul, who were wanting to just put a stop to the movement, the Christian movement. And so they were, you know, just going around just arresting people. Let's read. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, was, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Okay. Now, this is bad, but then the Lord takes what the devil meant for evil and turned it for good. Remember, he told the disciples, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be witness unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and out to the uttermost parts of the earth. Up until this point in time, they were having such a good time, they weren't even going anywhere. They were just staying right there in Jerusalem, fellowshipping, breaking bread from house to house, and, and uh, uh, continuing in the apostles' doctrine, all good, but they weren't getting about what God told them to do. So now they begin to scatter as a result of this persecution. And uh, Philip ended up uh, going to Samaria, and he transitions from his role as a deacon to Philip the evangelist. And uh, so let's read, let's, let, let's put that slide up first um, just to reinforce the, the title. That's number 10, yeah. So Philip transitions from deacon to evangelist, okay? All right, now let's read, starting at verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were, a, who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Okay, before we go any further, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, um, you, you remember Samaria from the Gospel of John. You remember the, uh, the, good, the story of the Good Samaritan, referring to somebody from Samaria. Um, and you may have some other things in your memory concerning Samaria. Um, remember the woman said, you know, the Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. Uh, they, they were all Israelites, okay? But there was a division between the tribes after Solomon passed away, his son, Rehoboam, um, you know, was wicked and, and basically judgment was coming even from what Solomon did um, before he died in terms of all of the women that he married and, and the idolatry that they brought with them. But um, the kingdom was divided during the time of Rehoboam. And, they, and so there was a small group uh, that uh, associated with the tribe of Judah, and they became known as the Jews. That's how they got the name, the Jews, okay? Uh, the rest of them um, had their capital in Samaria, and so that's how they became the Samaritans, okay? So the Jews stuck pretty close, and the religious Jews stuck pretty close 
to their religion, you know, to their um, worship of God, whereas the Samaritans kind of mixed and matched a little bit. You know, they weren't as pure in their um, devotion to God. And, uh, but they claimed the same heritage. That's why uh, when Jesus met the woman at the well, she said, our father Jacob gave us this well. Okay, so they all claim the same heritage. So these were not uh, Gentiles. They were not a different set of people. They were just uh, divided from the Jews who stuck a little bit closer to, to the law, etc. And so the gospel has not gone out yet to the Gentiles. When Philip went down to Samaria, he is still uh, dealing with Israel. And as he preaches, uh, here he was a deacon, uh, up until this time, this was kind of like his launching out into his evangelistic ministry. And as he ministers to the people, God confirms the word with signs following. And people are healed and delivered from demonic activity. And the Bible says there was great joy in that city. Well, when you start running devils out, there will be great joy. <laughs> people getting set free. And now he runs into a sorcerer who um, had uh, uh, a lot of influence in this particular area. And let's see what happens. Verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorcery for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Okay, before we go any further here, I notice that uh, the people were impressed with Simon the sorcerer, because of the things that he did. He practiced sorcery, and, uh, and he did things that astonished the people. See, in the, in the world of sorcery, in the world of witchcraft, um, you know, and everything of, and in the occult, there are people that possess powers given to them by the devil, okay? Um, but the power of God is always greater. So when Moses uh, went to Egypt and he threw down his rod and it became a serpent, and then Pharaoh's ma magicians, they threw down their rods and became serpents, like, okay, we can do that too. But what else happened after that? Moses' Moses's serpent ate up all the other serpents, okay? So they lost their rods. <laughs> <laughs> And as, as the plagues of Egypt began to take place, uh, then it, it came to a point where the magicians say, we can't, we, we can't keep up with this. You know, we can't keep up with it anymore. So we have, we have, we see that now even in our modern time as, as Wendy was sharing how uh, there were witches active relative to the election. And they had, were performing their rituals because they're going to get the outcome they want. They want uh, uh, the Democrats to win. You know, they, that suits them better. So uh, they're casting their spells and everything for, for a victory along that line. But how many of you know our God is greater? Amen. See? So it doesn't matter, you know, a part of what they try to do has already failed. Uh, because they were, they were painting the whole map blue, a, a blue wave, they call it, they were calling for, um, you know, for the Democrats to get all of the seats. Um, and uh, uh, so the devil hasn't changed. I, I, like I said before, devils don't die, they just recycle. <laughs> so from generation to generation, they do the same. But we have to, two things we have to do. First of all, we have to use our authority because they're using theirs. They, they have the same principles that they use for evil. They speak their words. They make decrees. They declare things. Okay? So, uh, what, uh, our power is much greater. Amen. However, we have to use it. Amen. We have to, like I said earlier, you, you can't be panicking and, and getting depressed as if you have no hope, no help. Amen. 
Do you know who you are? Yes. Amen. We have received power after the Holy Spirit has come upon us. So we have to do uh, what, what God has shown us to do. And then we walk in confidence that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. And so we stand strong. We stand strong. We stand, stand bold. And whatever it is that God has asked for us to do or determined for us to do, we are to have confidence that we will do it. Amen. We can and we will do it. And we don't quit. Amen. We don't quit. So here this man uh, impress the people with his power. But when Philip came along, even he had to notice that this power was greater than what he had, and he decided to join the group. Okay, so let's read on. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem... Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we read on, let me, let me just say this part. So, so then Simon, the sorcerer, he also, he also joined the group, like I said. He believed, and then he got baptized, and he was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs that were done. He was impressed because he was a man that did signs, but he realized that this was on another level that he couldn't touch. So he got in on it and he was baptized. And now we see uh, evidence of a special anointing as uh, Peter and John come down. Also, we see proof that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is a separate experience from salvation. Let's read verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. This is a very clear indication that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is a different experience from salvation. Uh, uh, the late John Osteen was a Baptist preacher, and he was taught, like in, in, in most uh, Baptist churches, that when you get saved, you get everything. You don't need nothing else. You got all the Holy Spirit you need. You don't have to have another experience. And he said when he would read this passage, he would always say to Peter and John, go back. You got to go back. <laughs> you don't supposed to come. <laughs> because this was, this was contradicting what he was taught. Because if you received everything, then they wouldn't come down to lay hands on them to receive something else. That they, didn't all, that they didn't have. So it was no doubt that these people were saved because they had received Christ, they had received the word, and they had also been baptized in water, indicating that they had confirmed their salvation. But Peter and John came down and laid hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. So we see an example here of people being ministered to to receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. It also shows uh, an evidence of a special anointing because uh, some people have a special anointing when it comes to ministering the Holy Spirit. Peter and John, why did they come? You know, they came because obviously they, uh, you know, they, they were specially anointed in this area um, uh, unless it was, you know, that they, uh, Philip didn't have the same confidence. It doesn't mean that you have to have somebody specially anointed to help somebody receive the Holy Spirit, but there are cases where people have special anointings in that area and it's easier for them. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, let's, let's pause here because I want to do a prophecy update, brief, a brief prophecy update. There's a lot going on, but because of, of everything that was going on in this country, we um, didn't have time to prepare all of that uh, for tonight. But I do want to share something, uh, and we'll pick up on, on the uh, book of Acts uh, next time. I want to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's listen to verse 1 to 12 right quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning of the first verse. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come until, 
come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right, so here Paul is talking about the Antichrist or perhaps the Antichrist system. Um, that is going to come in the last days. And uh, then he talks about um, uh, who are restraining, something restraining him from being revealed. So if we go back to ch verse 6, it says, and now you know what is restraining. Okay? So if you leave the, leave the slide up there, that will be sufficient. You don't have to go back to the scripture because the scripture is on the slide. What you, and you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. So Paul indicates that during the time of the, of the Antichrist, when he, when he is about to be revealed, um, there's going to be something restraining him. Um, and then he says in verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Now, I, I'm going to ask the question, who is he? Now, uh, you know, I think one of the more common beliefs is that he's referring to the church. Um, but I had, an, I had an interesting thought because I believe that just like with the mark of the beast, um, as we get closer to the time and things begin to fall into place, we have better understanding. You know what I'm saying? So I was looking at a letter that came from a Catholic bishop to uh, President Trump uh, recently, and it caused me to, to really take a look at this and, because he was talking about how he who restrains refers to the church and particularly to the papacy, right? He said, however, the current pope ain't, ain't it. He, he ain't cutting it. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. So he's like, Trump, you it, you know. <laughs> so, and I began to look and I say, this is really interesting. So just something for you to think about. Um, because with the Antichrist system, it's a global system, right? It's the new world order. It is what is being set up now. In other words, the stage is being fully set for the appearance of this Antichrist system, okay? And um, uh, I was just talking to someone from Germany very recently who was saying that Germany is just all set. I mean, you know, they, they have uh, um, the, 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 the young people have been, their, you know, their brains have been <laughs> wired differently from the older people's. Most of them don't go to church. They, they're already programmed to look to the state as, as their uh, source of sustenance, et cetera. And, you know, they'll, they, they're about ready to fall for whatever. Um, and we see uh, things happening all over the world where the population is being enslaved. And we don't have time to go into all that detail. However, when you think about it, they have been working at bringing down the United States for a long time. Because the United States is too powerful. It's too powerful to blend into a one world system. And so in order for us to, uh, uh, to be a part, in order for them to achieve this global go government, this one world government, then the United States had to be kind of be brought down a little bit. And of course, it was in the process of taking place. You know, our military was being depleted. 
Um, you know, our economy was going down and the unemployment was going up and, you know, and the, uh, the, 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 the health care system that was implemented was designed to eliminate the middle class because everybody who was excited about what's called Obamacare was the poor people who didn't have to pay nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody in the middle was like, we can't afford this. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people who, they said, we, couldn't, we can't afford to insure our children because it's just too much. And so, you know, um, so here comes President Trump. And uh, he wants to turn everything the other direction. He's rebuilding the military. He's saying, well, I'm not a globalist. Huh? You know, I'm, it's America first. You know, I want America to be great. Yes. And that is a problem. Mm -hmm for the globalists. Yes. It's a problem for the Antichrist system. Mm -hmm. And so now they're desperate to get him out of the way mm -hmm. because he is restraining. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? So, um, and when it comes to the church, he is defending the church. When you, when you hear about all the persecution that's taking place against the church in this country uh, that uh, is being done in the name of the pandemic, then you, <laughs> you see what things would be like if you didn't have somebody to defend the church. Okay? So I just, I just want to throw that out because I thought that was very interesting because... Um, the, 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 the bishop said, man, the Pope ain't cutting it, you the one. <laughs> Restraining them from, uh, from issuing in this uh, system, this Antichrist system. So we are close to the end of the age. And uh, so we're just watching it play out before us because the pandemic, by design, as the, if you can notice, uh, uh, was to bring the whole world, remember the Lord showed me in March, the, the headless girl mm -hmm. with the uniform, mm -hmm. was, was, was designed to get the whole world acting just alike. Mm -hmm. Everybody, uh, every, every economy being shut down, everybody wearing masks, everybody being locked down, everybody everywhere, same thing happening, getting prepared for the full enslavement of humanity where all you can do is do as you are told, okay? And uh, so it, it kind of helps you see how this, it helps you further see how this antichrist system uh, can take over. And uh, we'll talk about it some more another time, but the, because, because even with the, uh, uh, the plan for the vaccines and the certificate of, of uh, vaccination or whatever, um, uh, Bill Gates has applied for a patent to connect the, that to a cryptocurrency, which means that, you know, you, will be able, you won't be able to do business. Okay? So what does that get to? The Bible says you won't be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. So um, it's getting very interesting. We're, we're, we're winding down in time, and so we want to be about our Father's business. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit teaching us, guiding us into truth, and uh, we ask that you would help us to see clearly everything that you want us to see at this time. While you pray quietly, if you're in here tonight and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, then um, that means that if you die tonight, you don't know that you would go to heaven. Uh, we wouldn't want you to leave in that condition, so we'll ask you to pick up what you brought with you and come to the front if that is your spiritual need or if you need to be recommitted to Christ, you, you're in a backslidden condition and you want to recommit your life to Christ, or if you are a Christian but you've not yet been filled with the Holy Spirit as we read about in the book of Acts, if you haven't received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, with the ability to communicate with God in the heavenly language, we invite you to come. And if you're watching us via live stream, uh, there's a number on your screen, 704-525-8638. Somebody is standing by ready to pray with you if you have a spiritual need along the lines that we mentioned, to be saved, to recommit your life to Christ, or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So 
If you have a need, you can call if you're watching, and also if you are in here, you can come on down at this time. Let's stand, please. Anyone need to come? This is your opportunity now. Okay, is there anybody in here that's visiting our church for the first time? You've never been to any of our services at all. This is your first time in the house. Anybody? First time in our services, period. Anybody has been here before, but this is your first time in my Sunday night Bible class. First time in the class, anyone? Everybody been here at least once? All right, we're glad that you are here again. So if you've been here before, then you know uh, basic routine, if you need prayer for any reason, if you've been attacked in your body or mentally and you need someone to support you in prayer, we invite you to come. Ladies to my left, your right, and gentlemen to my right, your left. The offering receptacle is up front if you need to uh, use that. Um, and also the altar is open if you just want to come and talk to the Lord br briefly about anything before you leave, then you're welcome to do that as well. Or if you've been forgetting to pray for something or somebody, and you don't want to forget again, uh, then just come and take care of that before you leave.